One, two, three. Voice with Julia, change your voice, change your life. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Voice with Julia's Technique Talks, where we demystify conversations surrounding vocal technique with behind the scenes access to great singers of today. I'm your host, Julia Radosh, and with me here today is the fantastic Andrew Owens, who is clearly a go-to tenor high note specialist. And let me just read some facts so we know what we're dealing with here. Oh boy. <laughs> Andrew's oh. career is bicontinental, and he has performed with some of the world's top theaters, festivals, and orchestras, including Irish National Opera, Theater on der Bean, Opera Philadelphia, Lineborn Festival, Seattle Opera, Bayerische Staatsoper, New York Festival of Song, Caramore Festival, Florida Grand Opera, Salzburg Festival, Cleveland Orchestra, just to name a few, in case that wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> Many of his roles lie in the bel canto, Italian tradition, such as Don Ramiro in La Cenerentola, Count Almaviva in the Barber of Seville, Leicester in Maria Stuarda, plus lesser known gems such as the title role in Aureliano in Palmira and Eduardo in La Cambiale di Matrimonio. Some of his other roles include Benedict in Beatrice Benedict, Camille in Die Lustige Witwe, Tamino in Die Zauberflöte, and Rodolfo in La Boheme, just to name a few. <laughs> <laughs> in concert and in recital, Andrew has performed such works as Orff's Carmina Burana, Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, Schumann's Seinen aus Goethe's Faust, Haydn's The Seasons, and Handel's Messiah. Future performances include debuts with Open House Zurich in Lucia di Lammermoor and a new production of Moise Faraon at the Rossini Opera Festival in Pesaro. That's cool. He also <laughs> returns to Theater an der Wien in Vienna and maintains a busy schedule of recitals and concert performances. Andrew is an award recipient from the Merrill Horn Foundation, the Mar Mario Lanza Institute, the Goethe Listener Foundation, the George London Foundation, and the Francisco Vinas Competition, where he was the first American to ever win the coveted Zarzuela Prize. Wow, really, you were the first yeah. American. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely tell you about that one. That was a pretty fun experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really cool uh, merit to have to your name. <laughs> yeah, one of my very good friends, uh, uh, Arturo Cruz, uh, Arturo Chacon Cruz, uh, a, a phenomenal tenor and a great guy. I asked his advice and I said, look, I'm very hesitant to enter this category for Sarsuela because um, no American or for that matter, no like native English speaker has ever won this award. I went through the list of all the stuff since the competition started and just being the good friend he is and always supported it. He just looks and shrugs and goes, then you'll be the first. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. So I just went and, and learned, uh, I, I already knew several songs, but I, I found a really gorgeous one that I love so much and went to the competition. And uh, I think I acquitted myself quite well. And I, I was very surprised when they called my name as the, as the winner. And, you know, at the, besting a bunch of people who are, you know, people from Puerto Rico, people from Spain, people from all this stuff. And I was like, oh, well, so very, very exciting. It was very cool. Very cool. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Thank you for and, having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to get right into the nitty gritty. Let's okay. Let's do it. Let's start with you know, the singer's epitome of vocal technique. Let's start with breath. Yes. What are your thoughts on breath and support? How important is that in your singing? Uh, it is indispensable. It is incredibly important um, to, uh, for me, we can, uh, this will probably be a topic we revisit as we continue to talk and I'll come back around and talk about this. But to me, the coordination between, um, like efficient chord closure and support in the body um, is, I mean, they go hand in hand very much because I, I, for a very long time, focused exclusively on making sure my chords were adducted and making sure I was making an efficient sound. I, I tended in the past to sing a bit, uh, we'll call it loose, a bit high, huh? Like a little bit like that. And once I found a, 
deeper kind of position with the chords, I worked so much on that that I, I was kind of crunching down a bit in effort to do that. And once I really started to kind of feel that lean that the old school singers talked about via several exercises from both my teacher, uh, Jack Levigny and also uh, Gerald Martin Moore, both of them just giving me, uh, especially Gerald giving me just these physical movement activities where I could really feel lower engagement. And I remembered Jack calling my awareness to it one time in a lesson, staring at me and going, you've got nothing going on down there, meaning just that the, the below the navel area. He goes, it's a little, everything's like this. What, what, what's going on? And then Gerald noticed the same thing. And in his, okay, if Gerald watches this, Gerald, I'm, I'm going to do a, my, my very uh, uh, loving impression of your gorgeous accent. So he's like, I just don't think you sing supported. That's my horrible <laughs> Scottish accent, by the way. But he just looked at me and, and, and noticed that there wasn't a lot of support going on there. We worked more on that. And just this idea of leaning into phrases on the way up and especially even on the way down, just carrying that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's vital, especially with a lot of the music I sing with a lot of this very florid uh, 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 writing. It's very important to not just feel all these turns and runs just in the throat like you're like a lot of the ways you hear like R&B singers, if they just go like, yeah, it's like very in the throat, but if you feel more, ah, this kind of idea of it being supported in the body more, it's, uh, it just, it, it takes a lot of the work out of what you're doing here. And it just, it makes it infinitely easier. So. so are there specific, I know you said that there were some exercises that mm -hmm. Gerald had you do physical um, kind of motions, but are yeah. there, training exercises that a singer can do to kind of up his game or are there is it more thought based sure sure i'm from i'm a i'm an extremely visual singer i think a lot about i use a lot of imagery um and in my own teaching i try to balance that with actual talk of what's going on um because i've had instructors not so much like voice teachers but people who came to work for a couple lessons who just dealt solely in imagery, but really never even addressed how to do it or what to do it. And just think about this. All right, well, what, what, now what? You know, I'm doing this with my fingers or I'm, I'm, I'm making these movements, but what, how does that coordinate with what's going on in my body? I understand that singing is very mental. Of course it is. But I think that if you have an idea of what's going on in the musculature in the body, it's great. So for me, actually finding things that aren't just images, but things that also involve uh, movements. So uh, finding the movements and the imagery together, for example, one is um, another brilliant coach that I love working with. I only met him a year ago and it was one of those, where have you been on my life kind of moments is a, a brilliant coach named uh, Giulio Zappa. And Giulio said, as I was singing my, my coloratory, he's like, look, I feel like it's not grounded. And I want you to have this feeling like when you, when you start into it, it's, this idea of, oh Dio, so preso. It's everything kind of opens. So instead of going, ah, so like in, 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 in Barbieri, it's this idea of, ah, oh, ah, oh, and it comes from this, ah, oh, ah, oh, and you feel that so much more in the body than you do here. And once everything kind of, kind of has this feeling, your body's more at the ready, everything is more kind of open. And you're not just solely, ah, so hard to pay, ah, it's, ah, it's this idea of that. And um, I may not be explaining it as, as efficiently as I want to, but it's just this idea of everything staying open when you do a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of this very fast moving stuff. Because if you clamp down and you sit here and try to grab these notes and manipulate them, all it's going to do is squeeze. And, you know, you tend to hear a lot of people in the repertoire uh, who, who sometimes they stop the breath as the voice is going it just sounds like very note to note and there's not a lot of this going through there and I suffered from that same problem because I was trying to make sure the notes always stayed in the right spot but once I actually engaged my body and just had it coming from my body more than just keeping the motor running then it was uh, it made it much more easier to sing and as a result, the sound was actually larger too, because it was a free, unencumbered sound that was supported by the body and it just traveled more. And there was, it was a bit more corpulence, which is what you need in that repertoire sometimes, so. For sure, for sure. Yeah. 
how do you um, think, do you think about alignment when it comes to support at all? How does that play into any of your thoughts? Uh, do you mean like body alignment or posture? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. I mean, for me, a lot of it comes from uh, 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 staying rooted. You know, this, you, you could look at an old in the middle of a park, you know, like the statue of Richard Tucker in, in, uh, right by Lincoln Center or or, you know, there's another great one of, of John McCormick behind the concert hall in Ireland in Dublin. And, you know, they're standing there and they've got these big open singer postures, you know. But at the same time, those feet are quite literally nailed to the ground. <laughs> so I try to look at a statue like that and say, this statue couldn't go up on its toes if it tried because it is connected to the floor. And I almost try to think of it that way, this idea of, although I'm singing, this stuff that does this, that does this, I'm, I'm rooted in my body. So much, not so much. I mean, yes, of course, it's always important to stay erect. I mean, I do, I do, uh, I do exercises sometimes just with my back against the wall to make sure I'm not, mm -hmm. um, you know, I sing this way and it's very uncomfortable at first, but then it forces me to, to kind of settle this way and find that alignment. Those are all great. But for me, the biggest thing is to make sure that everything is settled more than rising up because I tend to, sometimes my eyebrows go up when I sing and I find that the rest of my body takes cues off of my eyebrows. If this goes up, then my shoulders are gonna go up. So if this and everything is kind of more settled, granted the body's engaged, it's energized, but it's settled and it's rooted, which is the word Julio used. He's like, you don't seem rooted to me when you sing. I'm watching you balance on your, on your feet. I thought one day when he was staring at my feet, I thought he was judging my boots. I had like a, <laughs> <laughs> I had a new pair of boots on and he was looking and kind of had a face and I was like, all right, Julio, I know they're ambitious boots, but I like them. And, uh, and, <laughs> and afterwards he just says, you're not rooted. You're like dancing. I'm like, oh, and then I realized, huh, you're right. I do tend to, you know, to do this a bit. And when I really focused on doing that, the sound just got so much freer and, 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 and more integrated in the body. And it was just singing became less, uh, uh, it, it's it's just one way I was able to eliminate a bit of excess tension and mm -hmm. stress. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So when you take a breath, mm -hmm. do you, you know this is the hot debate all the time? Sure. To support in or support out, do you subscribe to one or both of those methods or something else? What do you think I support, about? This? I support down. down. Not to not to not to be contrary and try to find no, something cute to say. Fine. But my idea is just down and it's, and, and, and it may not physically be what's happening, but mm -hmm. for my mind, it's a, it's, it's anything I can do to think about getting things away from here. So I don't want to think about if I think as far as out goes out to me means the opening of the body. So if I, if my breath opens me up, that's important. I want to do that. And I want to mm -hmm. remain that way because like I said, when I was focusing so much on the throat, it caused me to crunch in. Yeah. It caused me to crunch in. If I thought of in the same thing, I got tight again and my abdomen got like right in here, it got very, very tight. And I didn't want to have that happen either because, you know, Jack would kind of poke me there, my teacher, and he would go, flexibly firm, come on, you're getting way too hard right there. Yeah. And all that did was just, so if everything stayed buoyant and open, then the idea for me was that this is open and then it's just a lean down. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea. So when I breathe and it's just this idea of like, I'm sitting on a yoga ball right now, but if I just do an exhale and I go, you can almost see me go up a little bit. Yeah. I'm actually not lifting or doing anything. It's just right. the, you know, my big old quarantine belly. That's, you know, <laughs> but that's growing with every week. It's just, it, it tends to, it's an yeah. engagement that just goes, down like that. And then therefore I'm able to just kind of, if I go, ah, ah, eh, ah, eh, ah, ah. it's this idea of it leaning down. It's not this, it's not in, ah, it's not yeah. sucking in. When I was working with, um, uh, it was Salvatore Fisichella when we were in Sicily and, and I was mm -hmm. working with him, I would watch his body and it looked like he was sucking in. He'd sing and this thing would go. And I remember speaking with Jack and I said, it's amazing how he just sucks in. He goes, well, he's not sucking in. It's an, it's an engagement of the muscles. As a result, it, it's just, they're contracting is all that's happening. 
And he will even tell you himself, like he will sit here as you do scales and exercises. And as you ascend, he goes like this. Yeah. So he'll go like this. Ha, 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 ha. And that's his way of thinking this. He'll take his hands on your chest and go this. And it's obviously a very exaggerated uh, physical gesture. But what he's trying to do is this idea that it's not, hi, hi. It's, ah, ah, ah. it's that idea. Yeah. And that's really what he's trying to kind of drive home is this idea that it's down in the body and it's that idea. So, I mean, my long, that's my long answer to saying, I think down as far as uh, support goes. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I, I love yeah. it. Um, okay, let's segue. It, obviously, breath is going to be a continuing subject oh, yeah, in, of course. in everything. Um, but let's segue into resonance. And mm -hmm. if you feel anything and, and let's let's pair up resonance with registration okay mm -hmm. and so if we're thinking about the voice moving through our range right mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. do you feel the different parts of your range how do you unite them what techniques do you use to keep that consistency throughout your range sure that's a really good question uh for me it's about uh if i'm going through it, it's, it's long, meticulous work, and, 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 gen, and gen, that's what singing is in general. And what I do is I try to let the sound guide where everything goes. And there's a sensation that comes for me when these are closed, these are adducting well. I'm finding the proper tilt in the larynx, especially as I go high. And mm -hmm. I allow that to dictate the shape of the sound, the vocal track, the vowel, everything that goes on there. Basically, that informs what ends up coming out, as long as that at every stage is tuned, so to speak. So if I sit here and find, when, when I do this, you know I'm about to sing something. <laughs> so anyway, if I find it lower in my voice, and I, I'm a big fan of eh, I'll always be a fan of eh, because mm -hmm. I think it combines brightness, and also you get the depth up here. So that's what I use to kind of start to tune the rest of my vowels. I'll explain that later. But basically, this, if I... Uh, It's not like blowing at the mic down or anything, is it? Um, when you speak, you're low, but we can hear the singing perfectly. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. if I go, ah, okay, that's where I want to find it. And then I move up. Ah, and then if I move up into the passaggio, I'm going to naturally modify my vowels a bit, but I, I don't think of, okay, is it E? Is it E? Uh, is it E? Uh? I don't think about that. I let the kind of the sensation and, and the, the tuning decide what the vowel is going to be for me, if that makes sense. So as I move up and I sit here and go, uh, it's like you heard it morph and you heard it modify, but that's all by just riding the sound that stays here. If I sit here and go, all right, well, let me keep a pure E vowel. Uh, I kept yeah. the ah, but I but I I lost all of the tuning and I lost the upper harmonics that are there. But mm -hmm. if I sit here and go, ah, 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 I'm keeping that in. It eventually, got to a uh kind of feel. Mm -hmm. But I didn't yeah. think, okay, Andrew, sing uh up there. I just said sing like sing in tune. Get uh -huh. the get the get the get the harmonics. And that's, 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 for me, that was more a feel thing than, than anything else. Okay. Once I learned how to really efficiently do that and mm -hmm. find that stretch, find the tilt, you know, like uh, you'll, you'll watch old videos of, of, you know, one of my heroes is, is Bergonzi. He's on my wall back there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually a photograph okay. that he, he signed in person when I was 17 years old. It's up there. It says, wow. Per Andrew, Carlo Bergonzi. <laughs> I skipped school. This is how much of a nerd I was. I skipped school my senior high school, went to the Met when he was signing autographs at the gift shop. And I waited in line. And I was with two, op uh, two friends who know nothing about opera. They just wanted to come to New York that day. Yeah. And they're sitting there like, who's this guy? And I'm like, that's Bergonzi. How dare you disrespect him? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'll, this is actually one of the guys who goes, when Bergonzi walked in, all the people in line are like, bravo, bravo, maestro. And my friend goes, oh, is that him? I'm like, yeah. So he walks out of line to go tap him on the shoulder. I grabbed my friend and pulled him back. And I was like, don't you touch Bergonzi. Like I was, I was, anyway, I digress. But the point is, Bergonzi, if you, you watch him sometimes when he gets in that range, he, he quite literally 
his eyes go back into his head and he goes, ah, and I really think yeah. it's because he's seeing that, that stretch. Mm -hmm. He's actually seeing where the sound is going in his head. It's mm -hmm. not going low. It's not, oh, it's not, eh, it's not this. Mm -hmm. he, it's this idea of it sitting there and doing that. You'll watch him sit and go, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. it's just, that was kind of his method. It was kind of his way of, of doing that, but that's how I have to feel it. And when I start to feel in like, just try to, it's, it's step by step in finding that. And then once I find it, it's, it's just about singing as efficiently as I can through all the registers. So, yeah, yeah. So these, so the sensations that you're talking about, they're a combination <laughs> of physical feeling or a kind of synesthesia of hearing feeling. What, what would you say? Uh, it's definitely, I mean, for me, it had to start with, 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 with feeling before it could be, you know, I could imagine all the things I wanted to, but if I didn't actually feel it for myself, then I didn't know the difference. <laughs> And for me, kind of getting that sensation was a lot of, oof, my first year with, with Jack was just making sounds, was making weird sounds, trying to find, you know, uh, you know, pry into it and not let it, as we would say, pop and get loose. Yeah. And what I mean by that is the difference between going, ah, ah, that's good adduction, but ah, it lets go. Mm -hmm. And I used to do that down there because I used to, oh, just let it go, Andrew, they're low notes, it doesn't matter. But uh, it doesn't set you up well for when all of a sudden you have to do a gear shift and you're going, uh, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden it's, it's, it's a more uniform sound that's going on there. So for me, that was a lot of it was feeling it in a different place and being okay with it uh, ringing and vibrating here when it had never done that before because, you know, I, I, oh grew up with that very uh, uh, mystical, mythical, whatever you want to call it, idea of singing in the mask, which, you know, Avanti, Avanti, put it here. And it tends to, and some, some, I hear a lot of young tenors, especially, who want to do this, and it's just, you're crushing the sound here. And this is really high, everything, mm -hmm. just for the sake of going, you know, like, 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 let's put it right here. And I used to do, mm -hmm. I used to do it all the time. But then when I started to, shift everything down of course it was uncomfortable it was very uncomfortable i sang very very throaty for the first part because it was a muscle that i wasn't mm -hmm. used to working out yeah. and i think that one of the first little vocal phrase exercises i got was the duet from lucia and just going and when i first was doing that trying to find this closure it was okay like, let me feel that. And of course, when you're learning something like that, you're always going to go too far and then you'll find the, the right balance. And it's why I led with, and I'm glad you led with, with breathing in this whole thing, because the more I focused on that, I found that little by little, I was, I was disengaging from here because this was uh -huh. such a new concept for me. And I was yeah. like, okay, let me really, uh, uh, uh. my wife would, I would drive her crazy because she would hear me just do these silent coughs and I would go, uh, 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 always checking in and making sure I was having closure. And you know, we're like sitting watching TV next to each other and she'd go, stop doing that cough. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I'm just making sure she's like, you're obsessed, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had colleagues and people saying, you know, you don't breathe low enough. And I'm like, oh no, tenors have to breathe a different way. And one of my mezzo <laughs> colleagues, one of my mezzo colleagues is like, oh really, special tenor breathing is not the same as everyone else's. And But then it, it, once I started to realize that, you know, hey, what do you know if I start to kind of put that support that I used to have kind of years and years ago of this idea of down in with this new concept and not throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. I'm going to have a much more complete sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So do you feel, when you're talking about chord closure, you bring this mm -hmm. up a lot, do you feel the chords closing or do oh, you yeah. just sense it that you do? Okay. It is. It's definitely, I will say it's, it's vastly different feeling. I mean, now it's natural. Now it's how I yeah. speak. I, I found a video of myself from 2011 doing an interview and my voice is like way up here because I thought I had to talk like a tenor, but like once I just, you know, let your voice 
go down here, talk like a regular person, everything relaxed. Mm -hmm. It started to, uh, uh, I got much less tired speaking. If I had to speak in a, you know, at a loud bar or a restaurant or something, I found that my voice would start to uh, scrape and crack after long periods of talking. And I was like, why is this happening? Because I wasn't speaking efficiently. You know, I was, oh, I'm going to put the, put the sound up here. It's jacking my larynx up. But there's absolutely a different physical sensation between singing, ah, and going, ah. Big difference. And in the beginning, like I said, I absolutely could feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's just this idea of, it still is striking here, but the difference is you can feel that the sound is born here. It's not just from here up. You can yeah. feel that it's coming from here. Oh, 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 oh. Like I said, they're very just primitive sounds, but a lot of these sounds I needed to be able to feel this sensation that was completely foreign to me. Yeah. So just, oh, instead of, I, 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 let's put the sound here. Oh, yeah. And then you feel it there, but it's not, uh, it's not guttural. I'm not okay. digging into it. It's, uh, it's still very light and it's very subtle, but it's just everything is here. It's a much more yeah. efficient sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so uh, piggybacking on this idea of registration, uh -huh. I'd like to dive into male falsetto a little bit. Yeah, sure. Okay, M maybe take us back, back to when you were first learning how to sing. Oh, How important was the falsetto in your development? And mm -hmm. talk to me about how you think of that now as well. How that sure. influences. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's always been a, 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 a present, a presence rather in my singing in that it's how I discovered singing high. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my very first teacher is a brilliant tenor named uh, Enrico Di Giuseppe. Um, you know, he sang, sang for years at the Met, at the, uh, you know, one of his, one of his things was, he was, his nickname was the Metropolitan Minuteman because he would jump in at a moment's notice for, it didn't matter what it was. I have alternating Met broadcasts of, some, of him singing Turidu in Cavalleria and then the next week singing Barbieri di Siviglia, singing Oh my gosh, wow. Because <laughs> his voice, his voice just could do anything. Yeah, yeah. And he just sang this and he was in the audience opening night of Werther at the Met with uh, the brand new production with Corelli in 71. He was in the audience with his wife and they came to him and said, Corelli won't go on, we need you to go on. He had sung a matinee that day of something at City Opera. And he just came to go and he goes, Ugh. and he went back there and he, had a, <laughs> and he went on, he went on that night at opening night and big premiere and, he, and I have the recording and he sounds like a million bucks. Wow. But, yeah, it's phenomenal. But anyway, I, I digress. I love telling stories, I apologize. But anyway, um, basically, he gave me an exercise when I was younger, and it was basically this idea of, of kind of singing a, um, you know, just going up and singing arpeggios and going, ah, and he encouraged me, when you need to break in a falsetto, do it. I don't care if it's horrible cracks and everything, mm -hmm. but just make sure it's supported. Ah, And uh -huh. the more I just supported way through it, I started after a year or so, where I would sail through these exercises. And I found that I was just instinctively, the more I did it, I started to be able to blend my registers. Uh -huh. And I felt my super high notes in a total mix back then, which was probably very healthy for me. Uh -huh. And at the same time, because I couldn't exactly at the age of 17 or 16, 15, whatever, I wasn't hitting high C's. I was finding that same that I found in the exercise. And then I would sing along with recordings of mine uh, that I had of like Bjorling and all these people, but I would sing in falsetto and I would go like, and I would feel like, because I was like, I didn't know how to hit it full, but I, I would, I would kind of, introduce it that way and then little yeah. by little by little by little I started to get more confidence the more I went up the scale to the point where like I'm not I'm, I'm really not exaggerating I have like these old re recordings from when I was 18 and I'm just he's got me singing uh b's and c's that are like full chest voice up ah, kind of it's like when I was I developed my high notes very young the rest of my voice was like mess but I I developed that part of my voice because 
you know, like most kids at that age, you know, you, 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 you find the recording and you fast forward to the high note because you want to hear the high note and stuff like that. So <laughs> I, I obviously, my emphasis was on that, but I found it that way. And yeah. then later, once I continued to sing higher, like I said, my high notes were mostly in kind of a reinforced falsetto back then. Mm -hmm. Once I started to kind of lock into more efficient chord closure, it was always with the idea of thinking and imagining falsetto, but with just this very <laughs> kind of idea. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, Jack, my teacher, uh, Libini, Jack Libini talks about mm -hmm. this idea of the squeaky toy, like a dog. And you mm -hmm. sit here and <laughs> like that idea. And that's that just thin, pure sound that resembles falsetto in many ways, but it's not airy. It's not, ah, it's, ah, mm -hmm. you know, it's like that idea. So yeah. it's basically, so yeah, I mean, to answer your question, like falsetto has kind of always informed uh, how I've approached the top. It mm -hmm. just was a matter of taking it from a really awkward, airy, <laughs> You know, to then finding ah, and a more, you know, a more adducted kind of posture for it. And then essentially just giving it more depth, giving it more cavita, mm -hmm. giving it a bit more stretch of the larynx, and then, but still always finding, ah, 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 mm -hmm. you know, down there mm -hmm. when you access yeah. these, you know, I've, I've had performances where I just, you know, a couple ornaments I've done where I just slam a high D, I mean, not slam, but just attack a high D straight on or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I've got to think falsetto for that. If I go, yeah. ah, I'm dead yeah. in the water. It has to be, ah, yeah. and it has to feel so, so kind of deep down here, but it has to feel like I'm singing a pure falsetto basically in some ways. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of how I have to go about thinking about that. So yeah, definitely falsetto is a, it informs a lot of what I do, especially in the top. Yeah. You, you yeah. said this interesting phrase. You said, stretch the larynx. Can yeah. you elaborate on that? Because we might know what that means, but maybe somebody else doesn't. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's this idea. I mean, there's terms like that, thinning out of the larynx, tilting the larynx. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's that idea that you get when you, if you yawn, you know, it's, mm -hmm. we talk about the, the yawn or something like that. And it's this idea of it's it's grounded in here and it always remains light and boyish mm -hmm. but it gets a bit more depth to it so it's the difference between going ah, ah, mm -hmm. ah. that's that's yeah. basically it's not ah, it's not anything like that okay it still has lightness to it but basically um it's got more depth it's got more resonance it's got a bit yeah. more uh uh but that's what i mean by tilt because quite literally we're going you know, I'll sit here and I can go, oh, 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 and you can see it doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's basically, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh. my larynx is behind my back teeth right now. But if it's, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh. it's this yeah. idea that just stretching, like I remember, um, I would hear guys like him, like Fisichella or, or, or Jack, or uh, mm -hmm. I worked with um, Marcello Giordani, God rest his soul, um, it, it, this idea of sitting here and they would do this kind of squawk, just attacking these super high notes really quickly. And when I tried to do it, as they call me, they said, you sound like a seagull. It's not, ah, 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 it's not that, it's, ah, 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 ah. And it's this idea yeah. of that's all coming from this, muscle engagement but it's just a really deep closed position of, of the larynx mm -hmm. and it's you know a lot of people hear that and they go oh god that's you're slamming your chords together no it's just very efficient do, do, yeah. do, 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 do. you know I, yeah. I i i could do that all day i'm not going to get tired because it's there's body there's coordination it's mm -hmm. efficient closure of the chords and it's 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 got that going on there so that's yeah. i will sometimes just check in and kind of maybe not as violent and high as I did it just now, but sometimes I will check in with that to make sure, okay, how am I doing? Am I, uh -huh. am I coordinated? Is, is, is the sound getting too high? Am I, am I grounded and everything? And that's kind of a little check-in that I like to do sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so you feel, do you feel the muscles in, inside the throat, the pharynx, the epiglottis, anything change when you tilt or when you stretch? Do you feel anything like that? 
Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a lot of it is, if I'm doing it correctly, a lot of it is where the, the strike comes from. Uh, this is going to be tough to, this is very visual for me, and I'm going to try to actually verbalize it. So bear with me, everybody. I'm going to try to do this. <laughs> but it's this idea of if I'm doing it right, there is a, there is a gap. And what I mean by a gap is there is a void from about here to here where I don't feel anything hmm. if I'm doing it correctly. And what I mean by that is if this is tilting properly, I will feel, okay, I got a nice ah uh, here. And then I feel the sound right here. Hmm. If I'm doing it wrong and I'm getting high, it's a bit here. Mm -hmm. And I start to feel like everything is pulling up. If I'm like, Finishing the tail end of Una Fortiva Lagrima, and I'm sitting here going, oh, cielo, si può, si può. I feel all that right here. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, but if I'm doing it the way I want to, and I'm going, oh, cielo, si può, si può. I feel here and I feel up there. There is, yeah. it's missing what's, it's missing right there because it's almost bypassing. It's not getting mouthy. It's not getting high. So yeah. what I mean by that is I will feel that. I've heard people say, you know, make the sound's coming out of the top of your head. Yeah. I never understood what that meant. And again, going back to Bergonzi with this idea of if I'm in the right place, I see that sound right above me right there. Yeah. I yeah. see it sparkling that way. If, I'm, if, I, if it's wrong, it's very mouthy and everything mm -hmm. is getting up like that. And I can feel it. But if I'm really really riding a good thin adduction like i told like this it's just up there it's right up there it's not here so mm -hmm. i mean as a result you feel it very frontal yeah you feel a forward when i when i just did the i feel it here but it's much more here than it is there it's yeah. not oh up there mm -hmm. it needs to make so. yeah for sure. Yeah. And, and does tongue position play any role in all of this? Do you think about the uh, tongue? I think when I was having more difficulty with it, I did. Mm -hmm. um, I can honestly say that for me, I've gotten to a point with the tongue where we become friends. <laughs> <laughs> I stay out of its way, it stays out of my okay. way. Okay. And a lot of that was things like, I did notice I had a lot of issues with, with the tongue on my e valve, for, for instance. Uh -huh. And what that was coming from was I wasn't allowing enough space. I, I did a great coaching one, one summer. I took a drive up to Plattsburgh, New York, uh, to the hometown of the, of the great Rockwell Blake. Um, I connected with him and, and he was very kind. Oh, come to my town, we'll, we'll have a session. And I was like, oh my God. So I got in the car, I drove up there. I was singing in Saratoga that summer and I drove up to him and, you know, he's, he was born and raised in that town and that's where he lives in this. He's a world famous tenor, but he's still yeah. hey, Rocky who lives in Plattsburgh. And so we go into his, we go into his church and he sits back in the pew and we're working together and he opened up a few times and sang and I'm like, there's that voice. It's still there. But the whole point was Rocky talked about this idea of finding more space in the back office. And what I noticed was sometimes I was closing off a bit, especially on E. And when I said E, mm -hmm. This went up high and my tongue was a bit high, but once I started thinking more, e, e, a little space in the molars back there and allowing a bit more space. Mm -hmm. So yes, in a way, the tongue is involved in that, uh, mm -hmm. in that a bit, but, it's, but I can't say that I'm you know, doing tongue exercises, sticking out my tongue and this and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. It's, to me, the other things, if they are situated, if this mm -hmm. is tilted, if this is going mm -hmm. on, if I have opening, if I'm supported, the tongue just does what it, what it needs to. It, it, okay. it, will, it, will, it won't get in the way. Okay. So there's no, are, are there any uh, hints to you, like maybe along the way when you were first training, you said you had to think about the tongue at one point. Mm -hmm. Were there thoughts that you had to think like specifically about where to put the tongue completely or is it vowel based? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I will say that two things that went very hand in hand for me was uh, when I had jaw tension and tongue tension, one always resulted in the other. 
And I found that when I started to get this out of the situation and kind of not eliminate, but when I started to really find more ease and start to form vowels more so in the vocal tract than something like that, not with my mouth, mm -hmm. everything's settled down here. So I think I mentioned to you earlier that I tend to find a lot of my vowels from eh. So if I sit here and go eh, if I'm sitting here and just manipulating and going eh, there's way too much movement going on there. And it's just going to be tension. But if I'm sitting here and I'm kind of loose and I go eh, Everything is, it's, 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 it's taken, it's out of the equation. I don't need to move around here. And as a result, the tongue is just, you know, just sitting there. It's not back in my throat. It's obviously moving a bit forward. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some stuff that I used to do, like, you know, the idea of, you know, I did have a teacher one time say, grab your tongue and kind of sing and do stuff like that. I think that's a bit exaggerated and a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that when you, it's like, you know, if you've ever been to the ENT and they say, and, and they're doing the throat scope and not the nose scope and they pull your tongue out and go, okay, now sing something. And you're like, I can't. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, very good. It's why like, I, if I go to an ENT, I ask for the, the nose scope. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I don't put the guitar string up my nose, whatever that thing is. I don't care. Like, <laughs> let's see what's going on so I can actually sing and do things without eh, like that idea. That, that, to me, that just stressed me out too much. So yeah, I, you know, this idea sometimes of, you know, the tongue against the, 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 the back teeth, the bottom back teeth, you know, uh, like this, mm -hmm. of keeping it loose and stuff. And this idea of, you know, massaging this yeah. and those are all very important things. But, um, and I did have to be mindful of those, but for me, a lot of it was trying to find efficient vowels, not lazy vowels, not uh for E, but trying to find that while making them not as drastically different than, yeah. than each other. Um, there's a recording, I think I mentioned this to you before, there's a recording of Caruso mm -hmm. singing El Uceba Nestel. It's the 1909 recording, the one with the orchestra, not the one with okay. piano. And he sits here and you can hear him infect all of his mouths with a bit of E. You can hear the openness of E. So he'll sit here and go, Lord, I fugita. Lord, I fugita. And he goes, fugita. Eh, you hear eh mm -hmm. in there. It's yeah. not disperato. Yeah. I, 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 I. It's this idea. It stays that way. And that's, that's, that's a relaxed. Everything in here is relaxed. You're not seeing like, feeling like you need to find a drastically different position for each vowel. They're a lot closer, right. but you still hear the words. Yeah. The text yeah. isn't fuzzy at all. I mean, it's, it's crystal clear what he's saying, but it's just infecting a bit of those more uh, oh, vowels with a bit of openness that something like air brings. And it's why I love the air vowel. It's, to me, it's, it's my favorite vowel to sing on. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I actually wonder when you're telling that story and I'm thinking, oh, speaking of like when he's cutting off, right? Mm-hmm the air vowel would really assist that cut off so his tongue doesn't yank down to the back of his throat when he's yeah. cutting off. Yeah. 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 And then he just reattacks. Yeah. And why not? Not Fujita. Hi. Right. <laughs> you got to do like 10 there. things. No. Yeah. It stays right there. It's in that position right there. I mean, yeah. he was Caruso for a reason, you know? He was a genius. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, you answered my question on uh, vowels that I was going okay. to. So that was, per that's perfect. That's wonderful. <laughs> Kill two birds I, at one stone there. I know, exactly. Um, but I do want to get into a little bit of coloratura. Oh, yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. I, I'm sure you're going to have great tips on this because mm -hmm. your coloratura is rocking. So. Oh, thank you. It's Let me stuff. know. I love doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, where do you want to start with it? Well, let's start with, first of all, let's start with just speed, okay? How, how do you think of singing really fast without getting tight? It has to be broken down bit by bit. Um, if you jump into a phrase and try to sing it, it's all you're going to do, in my opinion, and in my personal experience, is develop bad habits. If you try to sing an entire thing, it, it just, it's breaking it down, and that's something I got 
when I very first started doing color tour, and that was um, 2008. I remember when it was. It was uh, it, when I, I did Music Academy of the West, and I went kind of almost as like a character tenor when I went there because at the time I, I was very insecure about certain things, but I loved being funny. I loved doing fun stuff on stage. So I went there um, and I got in as like doing a character tenor role in their opera that they did. But then I remember Marilyn Horn's like, I want to hear you sing something real. I don't want to hear all this silly stuff. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I took, uh, I took color tour and she looked at me and she goes, you're a Rossini tenor. You need to sing Rossini. And I was like, and I, I'm like, really? She goes, yeah. She goes, there's a lot of things to shore up, but that's your voice. Not all this character stuff. Your voice is too beautiful to do character stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. And it just was a matter of just, you know, putting my big boy pants on and doing it, you know? So for me, a lot of it was, and that's how she said, she's like, you need to break down these things bit by bit. If you look at an exercise, especially, I call it the, the ladder, and that's the ones that go, ah, or ah, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to put those, um, in the, in the throat, like I said, to kind of manipulate it that way and think that you need to, ah, and yes, doing it slow like that is always great to do it. I think doing it slow is important to find that you're always singing through, not stopping the tone, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, the body has to be both engaged and loose at the same time. It's got, you gotta, there's gotta be some motion. I had the, I had the unbelievably incredible privilege when I was at Oberlin to have gotten a ticket to go see um, Oberlin's got such an amazing uh, 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 concert society that they do the artist recital series and my last year there Juan Diego Flores came into the recital oh wow you know, and you know and it yeah. was you know so he came into this recital and I it was in Finney Chapel which is like a big kind of old chapel and my position was up in the balcony there's like one balcony and I was completely profiled I got to see him completely profile. And I'm watching him sing and he's doing these like almost little wiggles as he's doing this color Torah. And I was like, man, he is very active in his body. And it's not so much tension, but he's, he's making things move. He's making, you know, all right, let's get this, let's get this going and, and get some body. Mm -hmm. He was never stiff. He was never, it was never that. There was a movement going on in the body. And that was one of the first times I kind of said, okay, there's more engagement than just your throat. Because like I said before, it's, I'm sure many of us, the, our first exposure to anything coloratura are like R&B runs, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, you feel that all in your throat, you know? Yeah. But then, and it's, so it's very tempting to go, you know, to do it. Yeah. It's fine. It sounds precise to hear the notes. Yeah. Yep. But if I want to think of more of going like, oh, it's this is idea yep. of keeping it light. It keeps, I feel a, a rippling going through my body to make sure it's always, all right, all right, don't get stiff, don't get, don't get stiff. You know, when I sit here and I have the, 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 you know, one of the biggest pain in the butts is, is, is the end of the duet with um, Figaro in Barbieri. No, mm -hmm. at the end of the duet. <laughs> because you've been on stage this whole time, you've sung Ecoridente, you've sung Semionome, you've done all that recit, you've run around in circles, and then you got to do that. And for me, these, it's, if I find that I'm getting stiff, I'll feel it. I'll go, it's all here. And I'm right. like, oh, I'm detaching, I'm detaching, I need to, my body is, it's, mm -hmm. it's always engaged from the top to the bottom. I'm not just controlling it from here. I have to have, and that's where the exercise I mentioned earlier when Giulio mm -hmm. told me this idea about oh, sorpreso, oh, 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 oh. panting. You know, you feel panting. Yeah. If you're panting in the right spot, it's low. And that's yeah. where you want to kind of feel that going on. And it's just a pulsing that's going on down there. Mm -hmm. But as far as to, uh, to get back to what I said earlier, it, learning it is the important part, is, is breaking into little bits like that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, great. Okay. What's next? Uh, 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 okay. All right. Now let's put them together. 
<laughs> or I could be cleaner, you know, things like that. Yeah. And trying to find it bit by bit because when I would just run into a piece, it's daunting to look at a whole bunch of notes and go, boy. But it's just <laughs> about breaking it down and, you know, because you're going to find a lot of these things that go a lot of those mm -hmm. figures it's very easy to just drop and let the voice fall out down there and go oh, oh, oh. and then you have this as a yeah. result but finding oh, 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 and always maintaining and staying on, a, on, on, on an even plane like here so it doesn't get herky-jerky because if I yeah. did that and I just threw away some of these descending notes or da, ha, throw it up like that it's uh, 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 and you lose a lot of the the, uh, the uniformity uniform whatever yeah. the uh, of, of the sound that goes on there yeah because yeah. i think that even though a lot of this a lot of at least from my voice i mean i found that as it goes on I, i'm often told all right you have a, a, a bit more of a fuller sound for rossini it's like in the, in the, in the bruce ford kind of style of singing where it's yeah. fuller and that's to me it's a great compliment because i love to be able to sing with a bit more breadth in the voice and stuff like yeah. that. So for me, there ha it has to be homogenous. You know, yeah. it can't just all of a sudden when you get to that, ah, 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 if I can, ah, ah, the way I think of it is like when you do a lot of those things is if you have a straw, mm -hmm. a standard straw, you know, a regular one, if you sit here, ah, ah, you bend the straw, it's gonna pinch like that. I try to think yeah. of it, you know, be more like a flexi straw. <laughs> yeah. Be more like one of those, because the tube stays intact, yeah. you know? So I'm still staying vertical and I can go like, it's, it didn't go, there was no need to do that just because it's higher. It stayed open the whole way. And yeah. that's, that, that, that's a result of just staying on the body down there and, and, and making sure yeah. that the sound is big vertical tube passing through the entire range and you're not just hooking and bending like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that must be really challenging then to maintain that openness if you haven't learned and solidified the pitches in your throat. Am I right? Absolutely. It, it, it's, it's yeah. every, you have to feel all of that because I hear so many people who will do uh, somebody I'm working with right now, um, uh, or not even just somebody, but just in general, when I've worked with young tenors, they'll do some of these runs and it's just, um, it's, it, it, some of them are glossed over. Mm -hmm. oh, they'll have the little ones. Oh, yeah. oh, they sound great. But then, right. oh, ten, a little sloppy, you know? And for me, it's like the goal, and we may not always hit every pitch correctly, but Remember that they're written on the page. It doesn't say slur. <laughs> you know, right. it's it's they are written there for a reason. And that and the yeah. way you find that is singing it note by note and really slowing it down, thinking about the relationship between, oh, that's a half step there. How does that feel in my throat? It's just slow, meticulous work. And it's mm -hmm. and it's 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 painstaking. And it gets so frustrating sometimes because then then it becomes a balance of obviously, if you slow it down, you don't want it to get weighty and heavy. If you're going, oh, you don't want to bring up weight. It's just a matter of finding where all those pitches are and then you speed it up, keeping it buoyant, keeping it light. So it has that feel, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I've never been an H person. I mean, sometimes I will go, ha 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 ha, if I need on it for an effect. But for yeah. me, I have to find the articulation in my body. It's, hey, it's not, ha 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 ha. Mm -hmm. ha which mm -hmm. I, I know some plenty of H coloratura singers and they, they get beautiful sounds. Yeah. And it's wonderful. But for me, it never worked because all it did was, <laughs> yeah. I was letting air escape and it was inefficient to me. And I was basically putting air where sound should be. Mm -hmm. So for me, the H has never worked. Me, I had to go, oh, eh. it had to feel oh, like a sob. Like, you know, when you, when you, when you, you get to a really sad part in a movie and you feel your body go, mm -hmm. You know, it's me every episode of This Is Us, basically, you know? <laughs> I sit there and watch, and then I have this moment where I go, mm. <laughs> It's not unlike what I feel when I have that onset. Oh, whoa! Oh, oh. mm. I feel the same thing yeah. down there. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's, that's, uh, yeah. 
color Torah is daunting for a lot of things. It's so <laughs> yeah, great, but <laughs> yeah, for sure. So now you've moved, I mean, I'm not saying you've changed your repertoire, but you're moving into bigger repertoire. Yeah, gradually, uh, bit by yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. And I remember my very first teacher told me, um, sing as light as you can for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, cause like I said, he started finally to take on bigger roles later in his career, but that was after a steady diet of always keeping lyric things in balance with doing stuff like, you know, at the same time, like I said, he was singing Bohemian Tosca, and then at the Met with Horn, he was singing L'Italian in Algeria. Like he was doing, uh, and keeping all this stuff in balance and going back and forth. But I mean, it was, but he always sang it with his voice. So I'm always trying to remember that even though I may be doing more exercises and trying to find a more lyric sound, I'm always going back to the things to keep things light. So if I have a week when I'm really, really working hard on, um, I think I mentioned to you, I have like a Bohem next season. Uh, mm -hmm. that I get to do in concert. I'm very excited to be able to kind of um, do a role that I did uh, years ago in a more reduced version. I get to do it legitimately. So I'm very excited for that. But while I'm practicing that, I'll find myself then go back to my Rossini and go, ooh, okay, let's, let's, let's remember to keep that light and bring that, but then also at the same time, bringing some of that lightness into the Puccini at the same time mm -hmm. and not beefing it up too much, you know? So if I can write a phrase like, you know, like, and not get to and do that yeah, right. and remember that i'm keeping it it's it's still light it's still beautiful i mean yes the orchestration mm -hmm. you may be doubled by instruments left and right as you're trying to sing but at the same time you want to sing lyrically and sing beautifully and, and craft that line and so for me it's often a trade-off between allowing how i sing each repertoire letting it letting it influence the other in many mm -hmm. ways i like to bring a more lyric quality to my rossini you know yeah i like to bring a leggero kind of lightness to puccini when i do it because you know i'm not a traditional super um um, um light rossini tenor that's really right. not my voice i consider myself if i had to classify myself i think i'm like in the old sense of the world from, word from the 20s 30s and 40s i'm more of a tenor di grazia Mm -hmm. if, I had to, if I had to classify myself, you know, my, my idols are people like Skipa, like people like Di Stefano, like that kind of, mm -hmm. that kind of youthful lyric sound, but it had the lightness and the dolcezza yeah. and the morbidezza. It's, that's my idea. So I want to sing Eco Ridente with mm -hmm. Eco Ridente. I don't need to go Eco Ridente. Keep it light. You know, I wanted to have a <laughs> full romantic sound to it, you know, right. with, of course, you know, being, um, faithful to what Rossini wants and what's stylistic but yeah I want to sing it with my voice which is just a bit a bit more lyric than is in that rep but then okay. at the same time I'm not trying to sing Puccini like you know I'm a big old Puccini tenor I'm not but I want to be able to sing it like you know someone who I listen to sing it someone like Matthew Polanzani who's just a phenomenal yeah. singer you know he's yeah. been taking on more lyric rep recently and he's doing it with mm -hmm. his voice yeah and he's doing it like all right, I paid my dues. I've sung Mozart left and right all over the place. And so now I'm going to start branching out a bit. And he does it beautifully. He sings mm -hmm. it lyrically. He sings it with his voice. He sings it supported. It's great. And that's how I aspire to eventually sing this riff. If I eventually am lucky enough to take on more of it, it's just to always stay within the confines of my instrument and what's, yeah. what's natural. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's great advice <clears throat> because I think a lot of singers sometimes take on things too big too soon and it can yeah. cause a lot, a lot of issues yeah i yeah, well, i was i did it i did a i did don carlos two years ago for mm -hmm. the first time and it was in the full french version you know and it was it was an it, it was again in those circumstances where it was a very very intimate stripped down setting the the the, the, mm -hmm. the um the production sounded really interesting to me orchestration was not as heavily but the music was still the same and i had yeah. to really think about how am I going to sing this? I need to sing it. And I had to almost trick my brain and say, I'm singing Donizetti. I'm not singing yeah. Verdi. It's not Don Carlos. Because, you know, that French version, which I think is just, even text and everything is just far superior to the Italian. It's just stunning. Just mm -hmm. all, everything that's in that original version, the way the text, it's just absolutely the stunning opera. But it's, I had to sing it lighter and I had to kind of sing it with my voice. 
Yeah. And it was as a result, you know, I think right after that, my next gig after it was a Cenerentola mm -hmm. uh, or was a Barbieri. It was Barbieri, I'm sorry. So mm -hmm. I had to go from singing Carlos to Barbieri. And I noticed that the transition wasn't as drastic because despite, you know, really giving some gas on some of those really fun B flats and stuff like that, like I still kept it light. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking this next Alma Viva is going to be a bear, but no, it stayed light because I yeah. tried to remain supple. And I yeah. had to sing 10 performances of that thing, you know, 10 wow. performances of that. Oh, yeah. a lot. That's a beast. <laughs> That's a beast, but it was such a challenge. And then, you know, I came out of it singing well, you know, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't my best singing by any stretch, but I was, it was a, it was a, a feather in my cap of something I didn't think I could do. So I, I yeah. look back on it as a, an achievement in many ways. So. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. really yeah. awesome. Well, I want to ask you one last question on technique. Uh, I would love you to tell me your mm -hmm. desert island vocalese. If you desert. can only have one vocalese to warm you up, to get you in form for the rest of your life, I'm sorry, you have to pick it. <laughs> no, it's fine. So to me, a desert island vocalese should do a few things. It should, I mean, for most tenors, it's, it's tempting to say the thing that you want is the thing that you sound the best on or something. Oh, I sound really good today. No, but it has to do a few things to me. It has to, uh, it has to kind of encourage and be a check-in for making sure that, like I said, my, I have good closure going on here and everything is efficient. Um, it has to be something to get my body kind of moving kind of quickly and okay, keep it loose. And it has to be something that does a bit of range. <clears throat> okay. So for me, it's this one exercise that I do, which is very quick. It's basically doing, um, um, like one, three, five, eight, 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 five, three, one, this idea of that. And it's on things like moi and um, bum, bum, and um, bum, 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 bum. And for me, they encourage a really good bum, 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 and you feel it pop here if it's correct. So basically it would be doing something like, ah, oh, finding, okay, good, I'm lining up, I'm not getting, um, 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 uh, it's not stuck there. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh. it's not mm -hmm. craning. It's mm -hmm. staying uniform. And I sometimes actually do that exercise in between entrances. So if I'm in my dressing room, like, huh. you know, right before I go out, when I do Cenerentola to, you know, sing the aria, it's such a beautifully paced role. You know, you have a break, <laughs> you, have inter you have intermission, and then you go out and sing the aria. So it's, it's not like Alma Viva, which is just endless. But Ramiro, you have that little break where you can kind of go in intermission. And, you know, if I hear them say, you know, okay, Mr. Owens to stage, I go, all right. And I go, um, hum, 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 there it is. And that's it. Yeah. It's, it's pinging in the right spot. It's not too heavy. It's mm -hmm. staying light, but at the same time, it's still efficient. So the closure is there. And the way I think about it is like, okay, I'll, I'll preface this again by saying I'm very visual. <laughs> it's, it's like if you open up a tin can and then you put one of those uh, rubber plastic flavor savers on top of there with mm -hmm. the, 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 to keep the can over there after you've taken off the lid. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of, as you go, um, 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 you've got, the top over the can, but you're just letting a bit of sound pop out. So it's it's not it's not that. It's just this. So it's staying in this, but it's super forward and it's a really concentrated sound. Again, it's not. So that's kind of my, you know, if I'm. If I'm stuck on a desert island and all of a sudden they say, Mr. Owens to, to the sand stage, then that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> when you were doing this, you were giving me the visual of like Fraggle Rock or something like that. Yes. Like <laughs> yes. It's literally like Muppet, Muppet mouth, you know, yeah. like it's, it's kind of this idea of just, just popping up slightly like that. So it's not flying open and ah, ah, it still stays yeah. anchored and low, but it's just a little pop, 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 <laughs> like that. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to have to try that one out. That, I haven't heard that one. That's a, that's a fun I, one. One of my colleagues, we just decided one morning to have just a jam session, like online, like on, on Zoom, just singing back and forth mm -hmm. to each other. And I gave him that one and he just sent me an email or a text and said, dude, 
I, I'm flying up to my top now. Thank you for that exercise. And I'm like, yeah, I, it made me so happy because it works for me. And, 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 and when something like that is proven to work for some, I get really excited to know that it's just not one of these exercises that, you know, just works for one person's voice. You hear some people do things and you're like, what are they doing? I could never do that exercise. It was nice to know that it's a bit more, uh, more universal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Absolutely. So, Andrew, where can we find you on the internet? Tell, yeah. tell us a little bit. Well, um, I, I have to double check and make sure I get the right Instagram handle. Because <laughs> some, sometimes I forget, actually. Uh, anyway, on, on Instagram, um, it's all one word. It's at, it's Andrew Owens Tenor, no spaces, no periods, no nothing. So Andrew Owens Tenor. Mm -hmm. um, I just in the past few weeks started uh, doing online lessons and coachings, which it's been great. Um, it's, it's, it's kept me very busy, which is really nice. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you right now in between lessons, which is great. Um, but it's, it's, been very, uh, it's been very busy. So I'm offering those for, honestly, people of all ages, uh, levels, whatever it is. You know, I'm, I'm offering them, as I said, it's on a really, on a, with everything going on now, it's on a, like a pay what you can basis because I understand a lot of people are not able to pay a standard fee or something like that. And that's completely understandable. And um, Initially, I, I didn't want to charge anything at all because, you know, there was that feeling of how can I charge other artists at a time like this? But, you know, the realities of COVID have hit me too. So, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but as I said, it, to me, it was this idea of look, you know, whatever you're able to, to pay, it's fine. And, and let's just try to yeah. have fun and enjoy. So that's, that's kind of what I'm offering there. And uh, there and Twitter, which I'm not on terribly, is, is at Philly Tenor. And uh, oh. You know, I'm always going to be uh, I'm always going to be uh, a Philly guy, even though I live in Chicago now. I'm I'm Philly to my core. Um, so yeah, um, and follow me on there. I'm, I'm my wife and I are doing these fun little quarantine serenades and posting little fun things here and there. And I uh, love them; they're oh, beautiful. You. Your duet, your duet with the Ryan Adams, so beautiful. It made thank me cry. You. Oh, I'm glad. I it's yeah. I'm trying to find a good balance of doing all the singer songwriter stuff that I love so much. And then also, you know, I had a little personal goal of mine to kind of learn uh, all of the Neapolitan folk songs I love so much. And, you know, after, after listening to them for years and listening to folk singers like Mario Maglioni and Roberto Murolo, these guys who have been like heroes of mine, I'm like, well, why don't I just learn? I've got the time. So I'm just every day checking off another song on the list. And uh, one of these days I need to actually just set up the, uh, set up the camera and just record them all instead of just doing it for the fun. So I think I'm, maybe I'll make a little album or something. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I would love it. Yeah, and, absolutely. and tenors, like seriously, tenors out there, please get your ass in and work with this guy because oh, he it knows would, his it stuff. Would be, it would be a pleasure. I'd, I'd, I'd love to. I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I think, I think you and I went over the hour time because I can talk about this kind of stuff <laughs> all day. It's fun. I will always be a, a tenor nerd, a technique nerd, a singing nerd. And, and now that I'm learning to actually be able to verbalize a lot of this more, it's, it's more fun. So, you know, so it's nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for giving yes, your time. My, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Been such a pleasure. And I think that this will be so informative for everybody watching. I, awesome. I thank you. I, I hope so. It was, it, was, it was a lot of fun to talk to you about this. It was great. And thank you for having me. Of course. Okay, Julia, take, take care. care.